Good afternoon, everybody. This is the second Zoom event of uh, the group called Reminding Histories about the history of community mental health in Australia. We will, after looking at this video and editing a bit, we'll post it on YouTube. Today, I'm very happy to have Robert Ramjam with us, who will talk about campus activism and the history of community mental health. Can everybody hear me? I guess so. Anyway, Rob, welcome to uh, this uh, Zoom interview. Great to have you with us. Rob studied social work some time ago at the University of Sydney, then became one of the very first people working in a house of the Richmond Fellowship in Gleep that uh, was specifically there for individuals that can be discharged from mental hospitals to help them on their way back to society. From there on, he joined the Schizophrenia Fellowship and was the chief and CEO for a very long time, was part of the Richmond Implementation Unit, and I probably still forget several other things. Rob, great to here with us, and I would say let's start with Campus Live. You deciding to study social work? What was being on campus like? What was your study like? It, it was uh, it was a very it was a great time. It was it was a time that uh, so I, I suppose to a degree I never expected to get to university. Nobody on either side of my family had ever been to university, and I expected not to get there. But if I did get there, I'm the oldest of eight children, and Mum was a single mum. Um, I had to get a Commonwealth scholarship and I didn't think I was going to achieve that. And in fact, there is there's something I suppose I've always wanted to say publicly. There is somebody who marked the history, first level history, HSC exam that I did, who I am eternally grateful to because I answered one question and it asked to discuss the sequel to the 1848 revolutions. And I didn't know what sequel meant. So I wrote about 30 pages about the prequel to the 1848 revolution. And when I told my history teacher that, he said, oh, you'll fail. And as it turned out, I got seventh in the state. So a marker obviously looked at the name and thought, oh, he's, he's an ethnic who doesn't know English particularly well. Well, I am ethnic, but I did grow up in Australia and I didn't know English particularly well. And I managed um, to get through, get to uni. It was incredibly exciting. Um, in, in the early 70s, the university was a much smaller place. I think there were about 18,000 students um, when I got there. And today, I think you're in the 60 to 70,000, something like that, students. So it was much smaller. There was an incredibly active social life. And, and I suppose one of the things that became really obvious was that a lot of people were there to do a degree, but they were there to actually learn. And doing the degree in some ways was kind of secondary to the learning that they were doing. And a lot of that learning came from out of, out of class, out of tutorial discussions with our lecturers and tutors, lots of time spent at the Forest Lodge Hotel, lots of time spent at Manning House um, chatting about politics. And I suppose that's the other thing that was exciting about the time, um, the politics of the time. It, it really was that time of change and a time that seemed to have all the hallmarks of great hope for the future. You know, everything seemed positive. We'd been to the moon. Uh, and even though we'd been to the moon, the Vietnam War was going on. Apartheid was still happening in South Africa. There, there were real issues. Um, and for me, uh, I was 17 when I got to uni. I'm coming up for the draft. Um, I wasn't a conscientious objector for religious reasons. I was a conscientious objector for historical reasons. The war was wrong. Historically, it was wrong. It should never have happened. And um, so I was anti-war. I was anti-apartheid. Um, life, life was very, very exciting. That sounds great. When you came to campus for the first time, did you already know you wanted to study social work or did you enroll in some other 
now um, I had intended to do medicine and become a psychiatrist. Um, and it, it, I'll say hello to Donald Scott Orr, who I see is, is part of the people watching. Um, Don was somebody that I got to know early, early on in my working career. Um, but no, I was going to be a psychiatrist. And I think, as I said to you, by that stage, I'd been doing volunteer work in mental health for a few years. And the psychiatrists that I'd come in contact with were all pretty crazy people. And, um, I, I, now, I now know that that's not true. <laughs> psychiatrists, but my experience at that point was that. So I decided that I would not do medicine. I would do um, psychology. So I enrolled as an art student, um, and the plan was to become a psychologist. You know, Sydney University in those days was all rats and stats. Um, it was a very behaviorist psychology school, um, determinist in many ways. And I didn't particularly like that, but I did the, the degree. I was kicked off on this. But as I got into it, I realized there's this other degree, social work and that I could do a double degree. And I finished off the psychology, but by that stage, I was never going to be a psychologist. Um, but I did the social work. And the social work was, um, I've got no idea what it's like these days, but it was wonderful. You had to do three areas of study, community work, group work, and case work. Um, and the community work and the group work just excited me, the the possibility of change. You know, it, it fitted the environment. It, it fitted the mindset that I had at the time. Um, you know, we can have these wonderful ideas about changing the world. And here is this course that's actually going to teach me the, the things that I need to know to do that. And in the process, I absolutely fell, fell in love with group work, working with a bunch of people together um, and having... And to a degree, it's where we've landed today. We're finally acknowledging the importance, the potency of peer work, uh, of people with lived experience actually being part of the team that is helping. So you know, the community work, the group work, both just fitted in beautifully with where I wanted to go, what I wanted to do. That sounds great. And um, yes, as people say about those things, they believe that we can change the society for the better, that we can all band together and make it happen, it was very, very strong. It was. And there were some good lessons out of the community work as well. Um, you know, so, social work is uh, a, about assisting people to make their own decisions. Uh, about, but in, in the community work, one of the people that we looked at, and he actually came out um, to Australia, was uh, Saul Linsky. Um, the, the lecturer in that subject, his name is Robert, I think it was Robert Mowbray, um, but certainly the surname I'm sure was Mowbray. He was Canadian and had worked with Alinsky. Um, and when you looked at what he did, particularly the, you know, one of his major efforts was the back of the yards in Chicago, which was a slum ghetto in. Um, and he got employed by people there to make it better and when you looked at what he did there was no question that there was a lot of manipulation and there was a lot of storytelling that verged on lies and it seemed to me that there was a degree of blackmail involved with the mayor as well but using all the strategies they managed to demolish the slum area and rebuild decent housing um, for the people who live there. Quality of life improved, uh, crime went down. And so, you know, there were lessons there. Here, here's the theoretical way of doing it, and here's the practical way, and you put the two together and you have a successful outcome. Social work has been criticised, for sure, it's traditional social work, for its individual focus. That to make things better, individuals should just take better care of themselves. And by neglect, broader factors like neighborhoods, society, etc. But in your time, that was different. Uh, no, the, I think that the, the taught word was still pretty much a, a traditional one. Um, that you you know you don't 
give answers to people, you help them find the answers that they are already seeking. Um, but there, there was a social worker, uh, she was senior social worker at Cullen Park Psychiatric Hospital. Um, and we'll come to Richmond Fellowship, but she was on the yeah. board of Richmond Fellowship. Uh, she once said to me, uh, one of the most powerful things about mental illness, she said, we're putting people into hospitals, we're giving them drugs, we're taking away their ability to self-determine, and we're keeping them in that state for a long period of time. They lose their self-starter. We, we've got to help them get the self-starter back in whatever way we possibly can so that they can then start to self-actualize, but self-actualizing is not gonna happen straight away. And you know, at, at that particular time, people were in, in some of the backwards of the psych hospitals, people had been there for 30, 40, 50 years. Um, and yes, they'd had everything stripped away from them to, to try and walk alongside somebody in what we would now call a recovery path was exceedingly difficult because everything had been taken from them. But the challenge was formidable. At the same time, there was this policy of the institutionalization, specifically individuals who spent a lot of time in mental hospitals were discharged. What happened to them? This was not yet sufficient to for them to become self-starting individuals. No, well, the, the, the story of the institutionalization in New South Wales is a really interesting one because most people tend to think that it happened with the Richmond Report and the Richmond mm -hmm. Implementation. So the Richmond Report came in 1983 and the implementation ran 84 to 88. Um, and people think that thousands of people came out of psychiatric hospitals during that period. I worked on the Richmond uh, implementation unit. And I think during the whole period, if my memory serves me correctly, 308 people with a mental illness came out of hospital under the Richmond implementation. Not thousands, but 308. But following the Royal Commission into Callum Punk, which was in the late 50s, early 60s, uh, I think in 1962, there were 12,779, I think, patients in our Schedule 5 hospitals. By 1965, that was just over 7,000. So that's when we moved a lot of people out of psychiatric hospitals between 62 and 65. And those people moved out to effectively nothing. There were no community mental health services. There were no... Schedule two psychiatric admission units in the teaching hospitals and general hospitals. You had schedule five hospitals and you had some private psychiatric hospitals. And I'm not even sure how many of them there were then because they seemed, certainly the schedule was there for them, but I don't know how many there were. So deinstitutionalization happened much earlier. Richmond um, certainly led to 308 people coming out, but the, the policy started to change probably with the 1983 Mental Health Act or maybe a bit before that yeah. um, to say that people are in the community, people should be in the community, we should be providing community-based services. Um, and, and at its peak, like if, if there were 12,779 patients in the psychiatric hospitals in 1962, that at best represents about 5% of the people with a serious mental illness in New South Wales. Now, people with a mental illness have always been in the community. Um, but that in itself is a very long and sorry tale right up to today. And you know, to get way ahead of where we're going, I fear for the next two years where we've spent so much money on dealing with COVID and our teaching hospitals are over budget and the easiest area to pick money off is community mental health. Sadly, if there's one lesson from history that applies in Australia and everywhere else, that one would be it. Mm -hmm. But let's go back to social work, University of Sydney. You were looking for an internship. Um, yeah, we had to, I, I can't even remember what it was. It was something like 
well, there was a certain number of hours of placement we had to do. We hung, When I went through, you had to do four placements. The first one was a bit of a nonsense. Um, and I guess it was just, a, you know, like getting your learner's permit. <laughs> you, you put in the car and told drive slow. Um, so the first one didn't count for much. The second one um, was a particularly interesting one. We did it at Marigold Girls High School. So we were the first social workers, even though we were students, to ever work within the government education system. Um, and we were asked to do that placement because there were three groups within the school who were at war with each other. And these young ladies um, carried knives. And so, so there, there had been some pretty serious incidents at Marigold Girls High. And that, that was really exciting because we were doing real work and we were making a real difference and we were able to bring elements of the three groups together in the most bizarre way. You, know, you you've got to cope with me waxing a little bit. But the thing, the thing that brought them together as 15, 14, 15 year olds was that they all wanted to see an R-rated movie. And set a bright. So we um, agreed that if the groups went well, we would take them all to see an R-rated movie, which I think was going to be the case of the Smiling Stiffs, if I remember rightly. But anyhow, we got there. So there was myself and a female uh, social work student, a lady called Margaret Hoff. Um, and 14, 15 year old girls are all buying tickets and getting in. And then Margaret, who's a uni student, the guy wouldn't sell her a ticket, said, you're, under, <laughs> you're underage, you can't come in. <laughs> And so we had to get all the tickets cashed in and we took them around the corner and saw the story of O, <laughs> which everybody got oh, well. They oh, all well. got into that. And, and that, that group worked really well. But the next placement, um, by that stage, I had been going to Broughton Hall a bit. And um, Broughton Hall was, uh, um, so Cullen Park was all involuntary, or mostly involuntary patients. Broughton Hall was vo only voluntary patients. And there was a psychiatrist there called Harry Freeman. And Harry was an anti-psychiatrist psychiatrist and his social worker was an anti-social work social worker. Um, I thought his social worker was a bit of a waste of space, but I, I really got excited by what Harry was doing in the groups that they were running. And so I asked Harry if he would supervise my social work placement and he agreed. Um, so I went back to the union and said, I've found my placement. I want to do it on this ward. And Harry Freeman's going to be my supervisor. Um, and the university said, no, you can't have anybody but a social worker as your supervisor. So you can't have that placement. Um, and I was deeply disappointed. But the, the, woman, um, the woman who was running, she did all the placements for all of the students. Uh, on her own and said, I've got this really interesting placement that I, th I think will make up for you and we're getting the one with Harry Freeman. And it was Richmond Fellowship. Um, and she said, you know, you can have this placement, go down, have a look, see, see what you think, see what's, what it's like. And so I, the um, following week when placement started, trundled down. Um, so... Glee Point Road runs away from the university all the way down to the water. As you go down, I think it's the very last street on the right. If you turn into that, it goes into a little loop, and the loop is Oxley Street. Um, and the house, the halfway house was there in Oxley Street. Magnificent four-storey, um, pre-Victorian, way pre-Victorian house. And one of only, I think it was only one of only five in a Sydney that still had its land title to the low water mark. So the house actually owned everything to the low water mark. Um, and I knocked on the door and I can hear this voice yelling out, don't go, wait. And then there's a sort of clump and clump. Um, and eventually the door opened and standing there was a lady called Elizabeth Toe. Um, Elizabeth was the senior social worker at Broughton Hall, and she was on secondment for 12 months from Broughton Hall to Richmond Fellowship to 
set up this halfway house. The house had been open a couple of weeks at that stage. And in those first couple of weeks, one of the residents had pushed Liz down the stairs and broken her leg quite badly. And you know, I think it's a real testament to Liz and the character of that woman. There was nobody to step in. So she either kept going or the whole thing fell apart after a couple of weeks. And so she kept going. And um, I'm here for a placement. She said, come in. I went in. Um, and there are lots of people there, but nobody's being identified as having a mental illness. That was kind of irrelevant at the time. You know, sit and chat to a few people. Um, I arrived on the Monday. The Monday night always was house meeting night. So Liz said, yeah, stay, see what the house meeting's like and see how you feel. So I stayed for the house meeting and it was just super exciting. Um, people talking with such openness and honesty about what they'd been through, about the issues that they had. Um, and also people taking, uh, so each time there was somebody or a couple of people who would have a, a new contact, which is what we called it then. So that person had sat down with Liz, worked out some goals, and they had a contract between themselves and the rest of the house. Um, and just er everything seemed right. Everything seemed like it was so logical. And the people themselves, so I'd spent time at, at Broughton Hall, I'd seen people who were just sitting in the discussion groups and I was excited there but when I got to this and saw what the possibilities were when you empowered people to speak their mind to expose themselves to talk about what they really wanted to achieve not what some doctor or nurse wanted them to achieve um it, anyhow I, I I did the first week as a full-time week just absolutely fell in love with it came back the second week and Liz who hadn't been home with a bro broken leg hasn't been home hasn't had a change of clothes hasn't had anything um she and I decided to split the week up and we split the week um not a little bit more than half so that we had an overlap but one of us was going to be in the house 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And the placement well, had a certain number of hours, which I would have knocked off in the first couple of weeks. But I so fell in love with it that I actually contemplated dropping out of university and just staying and doing it. And Liz convinced me that that was stupid, that, that I needed to go back and finish the university and then come back to the house, which ultimately I did do. So you said to you, you fell in love with the place. Can you just tell us a bit about what was the really appealing part of, of, of working? Um, I suppose, you know, I was, I was relatively young. Um, so I started uni when I was 17. So when I got there for that placement, I would have been 20 or 21, something like that. So I was, I was pretty young. Mm -hmm. um, I had I had done a couple of stints at Callum Park on the wards there prior to that. So I'd, I'd had that experience over Christmas break. Um, but it was it was kind of exciting because we we very quickly acquired a reputation and people wanted to come and see it. And the routine that we established very early on, was that there had to be a couple of residents on the board. So, you know, we're talking 1974, 75. The consumer was in power, but they had to be on the board. If somebody, I remember the woman who ran mental health services for Sweden was in Sydney and she'd heard about this and she knew about Richmond Fellowship because Ellie Jansen was from that part, not Sweden, but from that part of the world. Um, and so she wanted to see it. So she is pretty powerful, pretty important, wearing very expensive clothes. We'd organised one of the residents was going to do the tour. So one of the residents was going to greet her, was going to show through the house. The routine of the house was going to go on. So myself and the other person who was, because we then had two staff, the other person who was working there would continue doing whatever it was we were doing while the resident took the lead. And the resident 
did did the whole thing and eventually brought the woman back to the office. And I happened to be sitting in the office at the time. And she said to the resident, I, I don't see anybody who's got a mental illness here. Who, who are the people with the mental illness? And the resident said, well, I'm none. <laughs> It, it it had incredible power to it, and and that empowering of the residents. Um, you know, um, my partner did, was doing her PhD on roles and recovery, mm -hmm. and, and she was doing that. Um, well, I guess she's probably started some time ago, <laughs> but in the recent past. Um, the theory being that if people have good, strong roles, their recovery journey can be a, a, a better and more false and more meaningful journey. Um, but there weren't any tools around to measure it. So she developed a tool to, to measure that recovery. But what was happening with those people was they had a role, they had respect, they had standing. Um, they were important within the structure of things. We ran a couple of conferences um, and the conference, the, the residents helped on every possible level. Like one of them chaired the conference committee. Um, the program was developed. The, the registrations were done by the residents. And I, I, again, I think that's a, point, a story that's worthy of telling because it talks about the power of change. We had fantastic staff at Glebe Community Health. We used to meet with them on a monthly basis. Um, there was a really open discussion be between the resident, ourselves and them about where things were going. One of the nurses there was a lady called Anne Fry. And Anne Fry, to my mind, is one of the best psychiatric nurses I've ever come across. Um, she, her mindset was just absolutely perfect. She turned up for this three-day conference on residential services that we were doing at Broughton Hall walked in and saw the residents, who she knew was her patients, um, doing the registration. And she spotted a man came across and said, Rob, I don't think I can come to this. I mean, there's all sorts of confidentiality issues here. Um, <laughs> they're, they're my patients, I, I can't come. And I said, well, just, just come, stay till lunchtime, see what you think, just give it a, a go. And at lunchtime, she came to me and said, this is one of the best things I've ever been to. Um, the the capacity not just to empower the consumer, but to educate and empower the worker. I think they go hand in hand, and it's probably harder to educate mental health professionals than it is consumers. Now, just to to emphasize, but how common was this kind of approach at the time, 1974, 75, 76? Because now we have peer workers who uh, are active in the mental health care everywhere. Um, what was it at the time? Um, there, there were a few things. Um, not a lot, but a few things. But just, just before that, I will come back to that, but just in defence of mental health workers. Um, the, I mean, it, it, it is necessary to say, the, you know, a lot of the hospital staff only see people when they're sick. And whether they do a good job or a bad job, their job is to try and help the person get better and the person will improve hopefully in some way or another. And next time they see them, the person's unwell again. It, it, it's an environment that breeds um, a degree of hopelessness and negativity. Um, I, I, I don't necessarily have ill feeling about mental health staff. I was one of them. <laughs> so I don't, don't necessarily have ill feeling about mental health staff because I think the environment that they're placed within is an environment that is kind of negative right from the start. Um, and it, it's, it's hard to hang on to those concepts of hope and positivity when you're constantly confronted with the negatives and and I think today when they're dealing with not just mental illness but um you know the, the problems of amphetamines through 
is a very difficult thing. Bang up, back, back in the 70s, uh, there, there was an organisation called Aftercare. Aftercare had been around and it was one of the oldest mental health organisations in the country. So Aftercare had a string of houses. Um, most of the staff in those houses were not trained. They were, they were good people, but they were not trained in any way. Um, and they, they were kind of a sheltered, supported accommodation. But they, they did have a, a reasonable number of houses. There was a very exciting program called Parlour. Mm -hmm. sure. Parlour, um, nobody was paid at that point in time within Parlour. They, they were all volunteers, but they, they were uh, an association. They were a bunch of people that wanted to change the way mental health services were delivered. And they actually set up a string of houses through Glebe and Annandale. Um, and I suppose what they did was they took a naturalistic approach. The, the houses had mixed residents. So there'd be some people who had a mental illness, some people who didn't have a mental illness sharing the house in a kind of student household way. Um, but it wasn't about dealing with the mental illness. It was about living together in, in that more naturalistic way. So not a medical model approach, um, but an approach that said if we behave in a way that is naturalistic, things will improve. Um, Parler had its absolute high points. They started the Bondi Junction Community Health Centre, which um, was run by Parler for a period of time. Um, and then it kind of drifted away. There, um, I'm just trying to think there was one other because we established an organization called the Therapeutic Communities Collective. And that group had five members. So there was Richmond Fellowship, Aftercare, Parlor, Grow must have been one of them. Grow was around, yeah. Um, and they had, a, they had a couple of residential services then. And maybe Psychiatric Rehabilitation Association. Maybe. Was around, yes, mm. was around. But nonetheless, Rob, there wasn't a lot going on. Oh, no community mm. and especially initiatives in which uh, individuals with mental illness were given uh, responsibilities and roles. No, no. Um, and in fact, um, the one, one of the um, so written fellowship was based on the written fellowship model. Um, written, that was developed in the late 50s in the United Kingdom and called written fellowship because the first two houses were in Richmond, a suburb of London. Yeah. Um, the English were putting people out of psychiatric hospitals and they were putting them out with some capita funding around them, but really with nowhere for them to go. And Ellie Anson, who was studying theology in England, um, could see people wandering in the streets. And so she rented the first two houses and provided accommodation for some of these people coming out of the psychiatric hospitals. But out of that developed a model um, and the model was what I found when I got there. Um, the other model that had been developed, which started even earlier, was um, the clubhouse model, which developed out of Fountain House in New York. Um, and the difference between Richmond Fellowship and the clubhouse model was Richmond Fellowship never um, set their standards down as a set of articles. Um, it was always a, a set of good beliefs rather than the written word. Clubhouse actually mandated a set of standards. If you're going to be a clubhouse, you had to abide by those standards. If you didn't, you weren't a clubhouse. Um, so they, they were the two models that were around. The, the clubhouse concept was actually started by people with a mental illness. Um, people who kept coming out of psychiatric hospitals in New York and they agreed to start meeting on the steps of um, New York Library. So they, their first meetings were outdoors on the steps of New York Library, which wouldn't have been particularly good in winter. Um, but but that, beautiful steps. And beautiful steps, days. especially when they're covered in snow. Nah. <laughs> but a, a woman there um, took pity on them, shattered to them, and it turned out she was quite wealthy. And so she rented them uh, a building in 47th Street and then eventually bought the building across the road for them to establish the clubhouse. That was absolutely consumer developed and mm -hmm. run. So you, you had those two. 
We could have had the first clubhouse in Australia as early as 1974. We had to wait until much later than that. But um, what is now called Buckingham House could have been a clubhouse. Yeah. But the empowerment of the consumer was a bit scary. And so it, it became a, a kind of living skill centre, a very good living skill centre. Um, but not a clubhouse, not with the empowering of the consumer. So that was a place where it could have happened. Parlour, yes, absolutely, the empowerment was formed, um, possibly even more than Richmond Fellowship. Now, these, what you're talking about, it, it sounds just terrific, right? Um, how much of that is still around? Uh, how quickly, well, let's first say, how, how was this taken up by other initiatives? Was this, uh, this kind of work, was it taken up by other organisations? At some point, the words therapeutic community became um, unacceptable. So um, there's, you know, that, that concept of therapeutic community, uh, well, in fact, there, there's a place called Pete's Place in the Northern Territory up in Darwin. It could have been a clubhouse, mm -hmm. um, but they were told when they got their funding, if they ever called it a clubhouse, they would lose their funding. Right, right. Some, some senior bureaucrat told them that. Um, the concept, for, and I, I don't understand it because the, the bedrock of therapeutic communities is, in my mind, pretty indisputable. The, the outcomes that we were getting were pretty good. Um, I mean, we, we, we did a, a study uh, of residents out of Richmond Fellowship People used to say you're you're taking the cream, you know. You're only taking people who are going to improve. We, we took people in a psychotic state. We took people who um, were having six to eight admissions a year. Um, we, we took people who were pretty unwell uh, and, and managed through that. So we weren't taking people who were the cream. We're taking people who had a mental illness across the board. But we looked at a all of the residents who'd been in the house over a three year period and then did a five year follow up on them to see where they were at. We baselined them against themselves, which at the time was not a research methodology that was acceptable. So our, our mistake not knowing research at the time was to do something that wasn't acceptable. It is now, but it wasn't then. Um, but we baselined them and then we looked at where they were five years later. And of that bunch of people, which, which included somebody who's had the record for the shortest stay, it was a woman who was in the house for just a tad over three hours. She moved in, she took her bags up to her room, she sat in the room, and then we saw her scooting out the front door with her bags and she didn't come back. Um, but she was included. We had an 83% non-return to hospital with five-year follow-up. Wow, that is uh, quite extraordinary. But the research at the time was flawed and so nobody really would look at it um, because we baseline them against themselves. That is too bad because it sounds a really valuable set of insights. What happened to the Richmond Fellowship in New South Wales? It started with the One House, the Glebe House. Mm -hmm. You were working there. What happened? The, the Glebe House um, happened in 74. Um, and by 75, we had our first graduates. Um, and so people were moving out of the house. And they were moving, they would form relationships. So people would form their natural relationships and they would move as a group. Um, in those days, there was plenty of rental properties in Glebe and Annandale. So we would go and rent a property in the name of Richmond Fellowship. And it would become a satellite house. And if you know, we'd, we'd go to the, the residents who wanted to move, find a house that they wanted, we'd go to the real estate agent, we'd get the lease, they'd move in. Um, and yeah, as a satellite house, it was a kind of outreach from the core house. So technically we had right of entry, we had meetings with the people there. At some point, when the residents themselves decided it, it would stop being a satellite house and become a group home, which meant that we still, as staff, we still had some lives, but they were limited. 
And then at some point, we would go to the real estate agent and say the real estate agent, we want the lease transferred from us to them. So effectively, they moved through three different models of care or three levels of care without having to move. The house was theirs. And I think I told you I, I ran into one of those. Uh, somebody who moved into one of those houses in 1976, I ran into him in Glebe some, sometime in the early 90s, and he had moved with um, four other guys into a house. And there was still he and three others living in the same house. And one of them had had one admission to hospital in, in that intervening period. And that guy still had some symptoms that he was dealing with every day. He was still clearly needing medication and taking it. I mean, he, he um, they, I hate the word insight because in, insight implies that you should be able to see what's going on with you. But that guy had come to a place of acceptance about his mental illness and what it required and what he needed to do to maintain a degree of stability. And so his, his, life, um, his life wasn't one I would like to live, but it, um, it was a hell of a lot more tolerable than being stuck in a psychiatric hospital or having admissions all the time. And he had some genuine pleasure and joy, and he had his three mates who were very close. That's great. Yeah. So people well, went, went and moved from the core house to the satellite house to an independent. Yeah. With only having to do the one move from the core house to the place mm -hmm. of residence. There, there were a couple of people who, when, when it came time, uh, and we're saying to them, you should take the lease now. Um, they wanted to move. They, they didn't want to live in that particular house anymore. But that's, that's their choice, and that's fine. Um, we got a second house at Warunga. Uh, so Richmond Fellows had a second house up at Warunga. Um, and we battled on the, the original funding um, for both houses came through the Whitlam government. Mm -hmm. So Whitlam government, um, as Gough would always say, was responsible for doing a lot. Um, Absolutely. We, we got the funding for those two houses. Gough started the funding for community mental health. Um, and to his great credit, Malcolm Fraser continued it and expanded it quite significantly. But up, up until Gough started community mental health, there really wasn't any such thing as community mental health outside of a few non-government organisations. Um, but it, it kind of stalled there for a while. Um, there were the two poor houses. There were a lot of satellite houses. Um, and then after the Richmond implementation, a group called Gladesville Auxiliary amalgamated with Richmond Fellowship. Um, and so that brought some more houses in. And then um, at some later stage, Richmond Fellowship amalgamated with Psychiatric Rehabilitation Association and then changed his name to Stride. And Stride would be one of the largest non-government mental health organisations, certainly in New South Wales, if not in the country. And when, when you look at what they're doing, um, although, although a lot of it is no longer residentially based, as we were doing back mm -hmm. in the 70s, a lot of the philosophy is still there. Uh, a lot of the empowerment, um, so um, in the early days, Richmond Fellowship was the first per the first organisation to employ a paid peer worker, mm -hmm. Simon Champ. Yes. So Simon Champ was the first paid um, peer worker in Australia. He was getting paid from, I don't know, 79, 80, something like that. Um, Richmond, uh, Stride today is really strong on the employment of people with a mental illness um, and they they do it really well look everybody i'm very sorry the hour is up we should have booked a two or three hour time slot thank you so much rob for being willing to be interviewed and for everybody who came to listen to this interview this is one of the things we are doing in this research project on the history of community mental health in australia or the project called reminding history uh, is that so much of interest has happened 
in community mental health. Um, and the pioneers, we still find very inspiring, but unfortunately very little is known about this. And we are setting out to change that. And if you want to know what we're doing, please sign up for our mailing list and we'll let you know our next activity.